Listen. So the filmmakers who made 47 meters down decided to give people even more anxiety by going 47 meters up times 12. And I'm a sucker for these types of movies. It's the story of these two best friends who are thrill seekers and decide one day to climb a 2,000 foot tower in the middle of this desert in order to overcome one of their fears. And I personally uh, was never going to do this, but uh, after watching this one, for sure. This is some of the most effective movie making for such a low budget, with them actually filming on top of a mountain in the Mojave Desert, and then building a 100 foot tower where the actresses would get craned up, plopped, and then actually dangle off while they shot around them. I know that it was meant to be a short story at first, and you kind of feel it in the dialogue, because the banter really wasn't for me. Like, there's a couple of story threads that I wish were wrapped better, but for a movie that comes from BuzzFeed Studios, the thriller part was so effective that I would give it a junior price even though the backstory to me was kind of like a stream it. Let me explain. This is sick. Damn it, Hunter, what are you getting us into? So the movie begins with friends Becky and Hunter rock climbing when Cuba Gooding Jr.'s Jr. falls, leaving Becky hanging as her man screams to his death. After almost a whole year, Becky's still struggling to cope with it while her father keeps telling her to move on and he's pretty stone cold about it. Like he doesn't mind that a bat caused him to slip because he thought he was an asshole. Hunter on the other hand wants her to run away and conquer her fears. She lives by the mantra that you rest when you're dead so she pitches climbing this big old tower so they can have a movie. Hunter is also a YouTuber who vlogs for her Danger D channel so taking 50 feet of rope to climb something that's double the height of the Eiffel Tower, that's like her Mrs. Beast moment. Thing is, this tower isn't just in the desert, but it's also another two miles by foot after you reach the fence. The B67 TV Tower. I haven't climbed since. Becky, if you don't confront your fears, you are always going to be afraid. So with no food, and for some reason some chucks, they start climbing up the tower through daylight, making it all the way to the top together in order to take a selfie. And it looked dope. Dumbest thing possible to do, but what a shot. What the hell are we doing? It also helps that they shot on cameras with big sensors, meaning the movie isn't wide. You know, it's nice and tall, so it can reveal your fear of heights. And the director even claimed that there might have been some IMAX showings of the movie. Mix that in with the sound design of the clanging metal and the wind that really hit them in the face on set. And it got my smartwatch heart rate to go up. And I wasn't even wearing it. Oh my God! Oh my God! Like I said, I wasn't into the dialogue personally, but it is necessary to give you a break from all the vertigo. And it was interesting to find out that they actually had to deep fake the actress's mouse in order to get a PG-13 rating. Cause like I said, with a three mil budget, they had them up there doing their own touch-ups. Grace was shooting her own iPhone scenes, but that also meant that they were doing a lot of ad-libbing that ended up equaling 35 F-bombs. So they used this technique that they called vubbing, where it uses artificial intelligence to shift actors' lips and their face to line up the dubbing. <laughs> The director of the movie also just so happens to be one of the co-founders of the AI studio, so expect to see this done in a lot of foreign movies, especially through Netflix, who's already the king of dubs, and this just might be the next step. Hunter, how do we get down? I don't have a signal. Back to the movie, they end up coming up with a plan to prep a message on their phone, stuff it in one of their shoes, and then drop it down in hopes of getting a signal, when I think they could have just tied it to the drone once they got that and you know, just fly it down. There's a, there's a couple of drone stories, like uh, I think, uh, I'll tell you my funniest that I shouldn't really say and it's probably going to lead to uh, legal action. Yeah. And I remember driving in one day and we didn't have the drone, but we needed uh, we needed to film some shots. And I remember thinking, I have to get the shots from out because there's no way I can do it any other way. So I remember going by Best Buy and and buying uh, a drone, just buying a, a thing drone and going up there and filming this scene, like learning how to do it myself because yeah. I, you know, the, and doing it all on my own, uh, filming it, taking the card out, and then on the way back, I took it back to Best Buy. Absolutely. <laughs> And to get back, that's why in the movie, there's a thank you to Best Buy. <laughs> that's my guy. You then get two twists in the movie. The first being that Hunter was hunting for hunks that just so happened to be taken by her own best friend. So you realize that she's also up there trying to conquer her own guilt since she had him tatted on her. Hey, trust me. That causes her to try a stunt where she gets to the lower level antennas in hopes of retrieving their stuff. And nah, when she reached for that backpack, I damn near reached for my seatbelt. A lot of that comes from the doc Free Solo, which I would highly recommend. And that actually inspired the filmmakers by breaking down the psychology of why a drone shot isn't as scary as when you get the POV of a human from those heights. And oh boy, it worked. Bring her around the road. Pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes. 
we all fall down. Down, fuck. <laughs> I wanted to pitch that one. <laughs> Wow. Eventually they hit that act where they are parched and you start getting all the callbacks. Earlier they showcase some birds staring at a carcass and now they're circling their next meal. There was a charging hack that is supposedly true. I'm just not going to electrify myself. But then you get the second big twist and that's that Hunter's been dead this whole time. in Becky's heart. She also did die during that stunt to retrieve the backpack and got Gwen stacy meaning that Becky's been hallucinating her the whole third act. That's why Hunter just let the bag fall that second time. It's why she didn't drink any water. It's how she knew things only Becky would know because it was all in her head. I was really ripped. You're awesome. That is the Becky that we need for this trip. And of course, why she didn't pick her up. Now it is becoming a late act cliche for these producers because I've seen it in their previous movies. So the twist may not be as shocking for some, but when Becky uses Hunter's body to stuff the phone inside her carcass before plopping it down? Now that's what I call the other shoe dropping. Becky then prays that her dad gets her text and shazam, he's there in the next scene for the rescue. I just want you to be able to move on with your life. In the end, it's a great example of how you can have a small budget and still create some tension, how you can partly fix dialogue with new tech, but overall pushing that mantra that if you're too scared of dying, then you shouldn't be too afraid to live. Just don't do it for the likes like Danger D. Let's do it. Let's climb your stupid tower. Oh, I'm so excited! Thank you all for checking out this video. I'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comment section. I had mentioned it on Interca. I'm not climbing a mountain after this one. A hill, a ladder, uh, the stairs, and I live on the fourth floor. Like, this th this really had my uh, blood pressure going super high with this. I, I do think that it could have been a bit shorter. Uh, I'm not saying that it's longer than the tower, but uh, considering that there were some scenes that the director said were cut out, like the book reveal scene, uh, those are things that I think should have made the final version, but, you know, they had to make room for that Madison Beer song, which, shout out to the lyric video for that footage. Let me explain. Personally, I feel they like should have had an after credit scene because like there's no way the cops aren't questioning her after finding her dead friend who hooked up with her man in the middle of nowhere. Like they had clues throughout the whole movie, right? Like cherry pie was Hunter's ringtone. You know, 143 wasn't just in her nightmare, but it was literally on a note on her fridge. But, uh, you know, good for her, I guess. She got rid of her cheater husband's ashes and then Becky got rid of Hunter with a good hair. I am curious to see how the movie rolls out, uh, especially on home release because the teaser that they had originally, while it was very CGI heavy, it does show that the movie was shot to be even taller. Personally, I think that would be awesome to see. Once the 4K comes out, I'll note on how well the stitching was done for all of the effects, but overall, it's crazy to think that it's cheaper to film on location than to CGI the whole thing in post. Who would have thunk, you know? Other than that, I'm curious to know your thoughts on this movie, what your go-to stuck slash trap thriller is, or any other movie thoughts down below. Until next time, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll send you a Stone Cold Steve bobblehead.